for the kind of introduction. It's a pleasure to be back here. Um, I'm delighted to be here after 25 years. Um, and um, yeah, so it's a pleasure to be back um, after 25 years. I've been to speed up a few times. I can't remember if it's been three or four times uh, since, uh, uh, since the beginning. Um, it's a pleasure to be back. So I'm going to talk about high performance computing and uh, some of the things that have been going on. If you have any questions during the talk, ask the questions during the talk. It'll make it more fun uh, for you uh, and for me along the way. Um, okay, so I'm at the University of Tennessee in, in Knoxville. I work at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I have a position at the University of Manchester in England. Um, uh, and uh, do uh, too much travel. Uh, this is uh, uh, looking at high performance computing uh, over the past 20 years, not 25, uh, through the eyes of the top 500 data. So the way to look at this is uh, we're going to rank computers from number one down to number 500. And that ranking is going to be based on some benchmark. And we can argue if this is a good or a bad benchmark, but let's not do that here. Uh, the benchmark is the Lindbad benchmark. We're going to solve a matrix problem, AX equals B. Uh, it's a dense matrix problem. You have to solve it using Gauss elimination with partial pivoting. You have to um, uh, do that calculation in 64 bit floating point arithmetic, and you have to get a prescribed uh, uh, accuracy. A backward error is computed, a residual is computed, and you have to get down to a certain number to uh, qualify for that. And um, um, uh, you can implement it in any language you like. You can use parallel computing. And the way this works is you fill up your machine with a matrix, a large matrix. You solve the problem using your software or mine. I guess the software which you can use. Uh, and you report the rate of execution. The rate of execution, the time, and then we convert time to a rate of execution. And based on that rate of execution, you fall somewhere uh, on the list. Today, so this is looking at from 1993 when we started collecting this information until uh, June of uh, to, uh, this, a couple months ago. Uh, this, is, this is the way things have uh, folded out. The green line here is charting number one. So the fastest computer today is at 16 petaflops. 16 times 10 to the 15 operations per second. That's the fastest computer. The guy at the bottom of the list, the guy that just made it on the list, number 500, is at 60 teraflops today. 60 teraflops is the entry point, if you will. And then this number up here, which is being hidden by my clock, is um, uh, the, the sum of the 500 computers. So think of that as Excel sheet uh, computation, just adding up the numbers. And today we're at 123 uh, petaflops is the sum of the supercomputers uh, that, that we have in existence today. And then you can see you know, what's happened here over time. Uh, you know, 60 gigaflops was the number one machine. That was a thinking machine, a CM5, uh, back, uh, back then. Lawrence, uh, Los Alamos National Lab. And then the guy at the bottom of the list is at 400 megaflops. So you know, a number of interesting things fall out of the list. Um, you know, the slope of the curve, it's uh, better than Moore's Law. Better than Moore's Law. Why is it better than Moore's Law? Uh, parallel processing. Every time the thing comes out, you know, more processors being used sort of gives things a boost. You know, it's, it's stunning here. The guy at the bottom of the list today, that was the sum of all the computers back in, in 2000. So the sum of all the computers in 2000 was the guy that just made it on the list. Again, a very stunning, you know, exponentials are uh, sort of incredible when you see them. Six to eight years from going from number one to falling off the list. So you pay $200 million for a machine, and uh, six years later, you throw it away. Right? It's not, not worth very much. Uh, the maintenance is very expensive on the machine. Um, you know, my laptops, this is sort of a stunning technology here. So this is a four-core uh, Intel processor, four-core Intel processor. I run the benchmark on my laptop. In fact, I run it through MATLAB. So MATLAB uses LAPAC underneath for solving matrix problems. LAPAC has been you know, sped up quite a bit. And even going through MATLAB, solving that matrix problem, so matrix is about size 10,000 on this machine. This machine, 10,000, four core. I get 60 gigaflops out of that. 60 gigaflops out of a machine I use to read email. You know, that's incredible. That's, you know, it's hard for me to get my hands around that. What's a 70 gigaflops? What's more incredible is that we've been on the top 500 list in, in the year 2000, where right? I just made it. And what's, what's really stunning here, that would have been the fastest computer back in 1993. So the, my laptop is now equal to what that 
thinking machine CM5 performance, a thousand 1024 processor CM5 that was uh, back in 1993. That, that's, a, you know, that's an incredible situation that we have today. So very stunning. And you know, we see this trickle-down effect of uh, technology. Uh, so you know, my, uh, my iPhone, my iPhone has a very impressive processor. It does floating point arithmetic. I can run the benchmark on my iPhone and iPad. There's an app for that. You can download it and run it. It's free. Um, uh, and I get a gigaflop out of my iPhone. A gigaflop out of my iPhone. Now that's a stunning, that's a 64-bit, you know, floating point computation going on here, right? So that's a stunning, that would go on the top five in 95. So that's, you know, that's um, amazing technology changes which are taking place around us here. And, uh, you know, we expect that uh, to continue uh, in the future in some sense. And I'd like to take a look at some of that. Some of that change. This is a list of the top 10 machines. So we're looking at the, the top, the fastest machines, the fastest machines at the DOE facility. It's uh, at a lab that we refer to as the National Nuclear Security Agency, NSA, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. It's called the Sequoia. It's a Blue Gene Q. It has 16 cores. So the processor base is a 16 core chip. It uses a custom interconnect to connect nodes together. And it has 1.5 million cores. 1.5 million cores. So if there's a big story this year, it's the, it's the, it's the fact that we've got a machine with over a million cores. Right? 1 million cores. And uh, using 1.5 million cores, it achieved 16 uh, petaflops. So that was, the, that was the performance out of those, uh, out of those, uh, out of that machine. And that was at 81% of the theoretical peak. 81%. That's a, again, that's a stunning, Achievement, 81% of the peak performance was achieved. The power is um, 8.6 megawatts of power. So that's power, that's the power under load. That's running the benchmark. It, uh, it, it was consuming 8.6, so the instantaneous rate um, is 8.6 um, megawatts. And um, the, uh, this is the measure of efficiency, flops per watt, megaflops per watt. And that number that's hidden there is about 2,000, 2,000, um, uh, megaflops per watt, two gigaflops per watt. That's a very, that's a very high number. So it's a very efficient machine, very efficient. And you can see some of the other efficiencies as we go down the list here. It, so the blue gene cues are really quite impressive in terms of their efficiency, in terms of their percent of peak performance. Very well balanced machine in terms of floating point and uh, the communication bandwidth of the machine itself. Very, uh, very impressive numbers there. Uh, all the way down the list. And the, this is the first time the Blue Gene Q has appeared on the list. So the Blue Gene Q just came out, so to speak, uh, in terms of the, uh, the big part. Okay, so uh, 1.5 million cores uh, is the big news in, 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 uh, in, in 2012. Uh, 2012 um, uh, and you can see the large numbers of cores in the top, the top 10 machines there. Um, uh, power is a big deal on these machines. So just to in the states, a rule of thumb in the states is one megawatt per year is one million dollars. That's the cost of one megawatt. I don't know whether it's here, here in Switzerland, perhaps a little bit more. Um, uh, but uh, so a machine at uh, at eight megawatts, it's eight million dollars to turn it on. Is the cost just for the power requirements, right? So that's becoming a, a more and more important aspect of high performance computing, the power requirements. <laughs> and you know, there's a couple of uh, a couple of uh, hybrid machines on the list, and they're both in China. Uh, the N one A, which was number one a few years ago, uh, uses Intel parts, a six-core processor, plus NVIDIA uh, GPUs, uh, plus the customized interconnect. So the uh, the interesting thing about that machine is the custom interconnect. So that was designed by the people at the National uh, the University for Defense Technology in China. And then there's another machine here in, in Shenzhen, which is a uh, uh, Intel, a uh, very similar machine that they used in Finiband for their interconnect. So uh, what we see from these machines here is that um, we get a pretty low return here, 50% roughly, in terms of the uh, efficiency, 50% efficiency. And that comes about because of two reasons, two reasons. The first reason is the PCI Express Plus. So there's a, there's a processor, and then there's a GPU, and there's a connection between them. You have to pass data over to the GPU, do the computation, and then pass data back to the, to the host, to the CPU part of the machine. That connection is through a PCI Express, which is very slow relative to the computing power of the GPU. So that's one reason why the performance is lower. 
The other reason why it's lower is on the NVIDIA. This is a Fermi board, NVIDIA Fermi board. The peak performance for matrix multiply, matrix multiply dense matrix large matrices on the NVIDIA board is only two thirds of the theoretical peak performance. So they're not able to extract uh, enough performance, even when things are resident on the GPU, they're only getting two thirds of the peak on the GPU. So the performance of running a, a larger application drops much more dramatically because of the link and because of that uh, two thirds uh, effect. The Kepler, the one that's about to come out, uh, should relieve that. It should be much better in terms of the efficiency for matrix multiply. Uh, your performance may even vary. Uh, so that's sort of the situation today. Um, uh, three machines in, in the U.S., um, uh, two, two machines in Germany, one machine in Italy. Uh, China has a couple machines. Uh, let me just point out here, this guy here says 90% of the theoretical peak. 90%. Uh, that's a cheat. They really didn't get 90%. This is, uh, this is a, this is a uh, machine which is based on Intel's uh, commodity chipset. Um, uh, that, and that, uh, that commodity chipset has a feature called Turbo Boost. So Intel's Turbo Boost says they tell you that the cycle time is this, and then if you run something, they can actually accelerate the cycle time to make it faster, right? So the, the, the theoretical peak is based on the quoted cycle time, not the Turbo Boost cycle time. So when this is running, they get a benefit of the Turbo Boost cycle time. So we're going to have to downgrade them somehow. I, we haven't quite figured out how to do that. Because I think that's, they, they should be penalized. They should tell us what their turbo boost cycle time, and we're going to rate that as their theoretical uh, Just a side point. OK, so uh, in terms of uh, you know, hybrid architecture of GPUs, this is a, a big deal today. A lot of people are interested in it. Uh, today, there are 58 machines on the top 500 which use GPUs. So is that a large or a small number? There's been a lot of hype about GPUs. So in some sense, that's a small number, uh, but it's growing, right? Uh, NVIDIA has the most, uh, the most of that 58. Um, uh, ATI or, or AMD has two machines, and Intel might, they, they produce one machine which is using the might, uh, the, in the Xeon Phi architecture. And you can see where the machines are uh, distributed. The US has uh, 27, China has seven of those machines. So I would expect these numbers here to increase um, over the next over the next few years uh, in terms of hybrid architectures. Um, okay, so this is looking at um, where we have 500 computers. Where are those computers in terms of countries? Where are the computers in terms of countries? And the, the, so there are 500 rectangles here. Each rectangle, the area of the rectangle, is uh, based on the um, performance that that machine has. So this is the fastest machine, the, has the biggest area. Uh, that's the, uh, uh, the Blue Gene Cube. This is the uh, number two machine, uh, and so on and so forth down the list. So the US has this uh, quantity, two more than half of the machines are in the US. Um, uh, China comes in number two. China has 68 machines. A few years ago, like four years ago, China had zero machines on the list. Zero machines, right? So they made a concerted effort, big investment went on in China, uh, to deploy high performance computing. And uh, they are now, um, they, they're second rate, uh, second, uh, they come in second in terms of the number of machines. China's investing also um, in uh, architecture and, and technology. Uh, there's one machine on the list that uses the Chinese processor, Chinese indigenous uh, processor. All the other machines are based on Western technology in that, uh, in that context. So you might ask, where is uh, Switzerland in this case? Okay, so this is Switzerland down here. There's uh, one computer on the top 500 list in Switzerland, right? So that's a machine in, uh, in Lugano uh, uh, at CSCS. Uh, that's where it uh, falls. So I took a look at all the machines uh, that uh, were on all the lists uh, from Switzerland, right? And if you take a look at that, you end up with this scatter plot. So the way to read this is we're going over time here from, uh, from the beginning to uh, the most recent list. And we're, we're, we're putting, uh, we're ranking the machines. This is the fastest machine, this is the slowest machine. And the dots here represent the machines in Switzerland. And you see a few things. So the blue dot is the fastest machine, right, in Switzerland. And the fastest machine in Switzerland is that, that machine there. That's the machine in, in the battle, uh, today. And um, this is a count of the machines in Switzerland for each of the lists. And the thing that you is, is what's striking to me is today there's one machine on the list, one machine, 
in Switzerland. There's never been zero machines on the list, so that's, that's the, perhaps the good news. We had a high point here in June of 95, and there were 12 machines on the list, 12 machines on the list, 12 supercomputers um, in uh, Switzerland. And you can see that so you had a low point here in 2002, so the investment was not made so heavily, and I guess you could say the investment is not being made today. You have only one machine on the list that becomes a high point. And you can see sort of these trends here. So this is a this is a very fast machine over the years. It sort of went down and eventually fall off, fall off the list. And you see that from here, here, and here. So I, I don't know what happened economically in Switzerland in this period, um, but it looks like it's about to happen again in this period. Be <laughs> 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 careful. <laughs> Okay, so um, uh, if we take a look at the um, uh, peak performance of uh, the computers and look at the machines that have a peak performance of a petaflop or more, petaflop or more, uh, we see this story. There are nine machines that have a petaflop in the U.S. And, and the peak, if you sum up the peak performances, it's 41 petaflops in the U.S. Uh, Japan comes in number two with 16 petaflops, China 11 and so on down the list. So these are the 28 machines that, that claim to have a petaflop of peak performance uh, on the list. Um, and again, you know, China will be uh, coming in number second here with five of those uh, machines. Again, investment is being made, uh, serious investment in <coughs> high performance computing technology. Uh, I just want to point out something about efficiency. So this is looking at the 500 computers that are on this list. And we're looking at what's the efficiency, theoretical peak to the achieved performance for LIMPAC. Okay, so LIMPAC is driven by matrix multiplying. And you know, if you can't do well on LIMPAC, you're not going to do well on other scientific problems. Let's be honest about things, right? So you've got to do well on LIMPAC. Your performance for, for doing a uh, you know, more traditional uh, computational science problems, perhaps involving solving you know, PDEs, sparse matrix computation, is going to be much less than, than what we're seeing here. And you know, the surprising thing is that you know, a lot of machines here, which are doing about 50% of the that's, you know, that's sort of interesting. You know, why are there so many machines around 50%? There's a few machines which get really poor performance. I would say these machines are this. Something went wrong with the benchmark that they reported. They, they, could, they could have done better, they screwed up. They just screwed up. Um, these machines here are all using gigabit Ethernet as their uh, interconnect. So these are low bulb machines, very low cost, interconnect, very poor performance, and that's being reflected in you know, less than around 50% of theoretical peak is what we're seeing from those machines. Um, the other thing is the GPUs. So these green ones are the GPU machines, hybrid machines. And again, we see relatively poor performance. These are the NVIDIA machines that are getting poor performance. The machines that are getting better than that, those are the cell processors. The cell processor uses the PCI Express, so they do a much, much better job of matrix multiplying. They can generate much higher rates of execution for that. So they're able to get much, much greater return, even though they have this very slow uh, mechanism for moving data around inside the machine. So these machines here that are, that are closer to the 70s and 80% 80, 80 are, um, are the machines that are based on uh, cell, cell technology. And these guys here, um, of course, are the NVIDIA things. So cell technology is out, right? So one of the, one of the things, you know, IBM canceled, the cell processor this time they canceled, uh, you know, the, the blue water system. I mean, sort of, uh, maybe at the end of the road for the Blue Gene Q. The Blue Gene Q may be the last machine in the Blue Gene family. A lot of the architects have gone. I don't know what's going to happen there. So you've got to wonder what IBM's future is uh, in that sense. So that's a question mark. Okay, so we're looking at the top 500 data here, and we want to extrapolate, uh, extrapolate out uh, into the future. And um, you know, based on this uh, data, which uh, is pretty consistent over the last uh, 20 years, it says that we're going to get to an exascale machine, exaflop, roughly in 2020. Right? That's, a, that's a, based on the projection. We're slightly ahead of where we should be today. It says that we should be at this uh, 10 petaflop point, um, uh, you know, right, right about now. We've got a machine which is, which is faster than it's 20 petaflops is the fastest machine. So we're slightly ahead of that. Uh, or uh, well, 15 petaflops, 16 petaflops, I guess. And it says we'll get to uh, 100 petaflops in 20, uh, 2016. So we'll see if that happens. There's a lot of challenges in terms of getting to that point, a lot of issues that have to uh, be resolved, um, a lot of uh, barriers, I'll say, to get to that, to get to that point. 
You know, one of the issues today is uh, dealing with data movement. And, uh, you know, when you take a look at the power consumption inside the machine, and you take a look at what we, what we pay for power in terms of floating point operations compared to data movement, the situation today looks like this. To do a floating point mat and multiply, to do that where the data is ready to, ready to execute in registers, it takes 100 picojoules. So that's the energy required to do that multiply add instruction. Right, to get a result, 100 picojoules. To do a read from memory, moving data from memory, primary memory, over to the point where that operation is going to take place, takes 4,800 picojoules. So data movement is very expensive in terms of the energy. Very expensive, by quite a bit. Right, close to 50 times uh, more expensive to, uh, to move things. And uh, you know, that, that's an issue in terms of um, uh, you know, the power, the, the cost of uh, doing the computation. And in the future, the projections look something like this. In 2018, we think about towards that exascale machine, the cost of doing that floating point operation goes down by an order of magnitude. 10 picojoules is the cost for doing that 64-bit floating point operation. And now the cost of moving data through the system, the memory hierarchy, goes from 4,000, roughly 5,000 picojoules to around 2,000 picojoules. So it's not going down quite, it's going down, it's not going down at the same rate as the floating point is going down. So data movement is going to be a big issue. Right? That's going to be something we really have to focus on, is data movement in the machines itself. And our algorithm and software should, should sort of uh, reflect that in some way. Should take, take that into account, and we should strive for minimizing data movement. What, what, what costs so much to do this stuff? <clears throat> I mean, it used to be, of course, that the floating point stuff was really expensive. It used to be. That's I mean, right. because the pipelines were so long. Why, why is it? Uh, so why is it? So we were moving uh, data across different uh, different lengths. You have to uh, energize things as you move things through various stages along the way. So it's also the pipeline process. It's a pipeline process from remote memory over to uh, some other point in the machine. We have hierarchy that we have to pass through. Everything has to be energized as it goes along uh, along that way. So and you're moving things over great distances. I mean, just give me the length of the pipe. Slight delay. So maybe we'll get some advantage if we go to optics, right? So this is based on copper uh, moving things across uh, that. So optics certainly would help that situation. And we may see a drop based on that. We need something to help. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble with that kind of effect. But with the optics, don't you get a, little, a higher latency? You uh, always have to go through the optical electronic interface. So, right, this is just talking about energy used to, to do rather than the cost yeah. of, of, right. of time to, to get the thing. But, uh, yes. Uh, so but we would relieve that um, intermediate uh, recharging as we go through the hierarchy. Okay, so um, if, if we think about, um, if we let things run the way they're running today, and think about building a machine for <coughs> the scale, uh, the cost associated with it today, we're, today we're at something like, uh, you know, we're at uh, 10 to 20 petaflops, 10 megawatts of power. If we let that run, um, uh, a normal course, let's say, we're, we have a machine which will cost 200 megawatts. 200 megawatts will be the amount of power required for an exascale machine. 200 megawatts, that's too expensive. $200 million a year to run the machine, to turn it on, it's just too expensive. So the people who have uh, control over high performance computing and who are setting the agenda and who are trying to understand how things are going to work in the future, they say, look, you can't do that. If you're going to build an exascale machine, it's got to be something on the order of 20 megawatts. So they impose a ceiling on the machine that you're going to build for an exascale at 20 megawatts. So the goal here for an exascale machine is at 20 megawatts. Is it going to be more? Maybe. But it's not going to be at 200 megawatts. You can't build a machine at 200 megawatts. 200 megawatts is what all of Google uses. Right? All of Google. That's, that's their build. Well, and you can't have one machine at one place at 200 megawatts. That just doesn't, doesn't make sense. So DOE says, the Department of Energy says, you're going to build an exascale machine, that's one of the constraints on it. The other constraint is $200 million is the cost of the machine. The machine cannot cost more than $200 million. <coughs> that's, a, that's a standard price that we think about paying for, uh, for the fastest machine. Okay, so. Uh, if we take a look at what we have today, this is, uh, this is the fastest computer we have today, the Blue GQ. It's at 20 petaflops. It consumes 8.6 megawatts of power. It's got 1.6 petabytes of uh, primary memory. Uh, the node performance, one node of this machine, is 205 gigaflops, the theoretical peak. The bandwidth inside the node, moving data around inside that node, comes in at, um, 
uh, 60, uh, 42 uh, gigabytes per second. It has 40, 64 threads of execution, right? So 16 core, four threads per core. That's the way it has to be used to get peak performance out of the machine. That's, that's the way the Blue Gene uh, Q architecture is, uh, is built. 64 threads uh, on that node, one, one chip per node. Uh, the internode communication, communicating between nodes is at 20 gigabytes per second. The system size, they have about 100,000 nodes in that machine. And in order to use the machine at scale, the concurrency level has around 6 million threads of execution. That's what you have to manage. Today, that's what's being managed if you use the machine at scale. The Limpact benchmark, that was managing 6 million threads of execution. Right? That's, that's the level this machine is. The mean time between interrupt is around four days. Four days before the hardware fails. Right? And something has to be done. Right? You have to fix it. And if your application is running, then you're, you're dead at that point. So don't expect to run anything more than four days. Your, your performance may vary. Okay, so if we go to um, Exascale, if we go to Exascale, um, we, we're going to cap things at $200 million and 20 megawatts. That's the cap. That's $2012 or $2018? Uh, that's going to be $2018. $2018. So you're going to spend you're going to spend $200 million in 2018. Actually, so um, uh, 2018 was a projection that was made a few years ago. The Department of Energy says it's not 2018 anymore; it's 2022. So 10 years from now. Inflation five percent. Well, I guess that's right. Yes, that's right. Okay, so um, so we're going we're going to spend that much money. Here's, um, here's that machine. So in 2022 now, so if you, if you heard about 2018, erase that thing. The Department of Energy now says 2022. Exascale machine, 20 megawatts is the power, and $200 million is the budget that you have. You're going to take half of your money and spend it on memory. That's just the way things work, right? You're going to spend half of your money on memory. The semiconductor guy's got a pretty good uh, projection of where they're going in the future. Half of the money says you're going to buy between 32 and 64 petabytes of, of memory. That's the primary memory inside the machine, right? And and then you know a number of things fall out of that uh, based on those uh, projections and other uh, crystal ball observations. The node performance is, is somewhere between 1.2 and 15 teraflops, two to four terabytes per second internally. Uh, we got about a thousand to ten thousand threads of execution on the node. Uh, Internode communications at uh, 200 to 400 gigabytes per second. The node size is, is on the order of 100,000 100, to a million nodes inside the machine, and a billion threads of execution is what you have to maintain to run your application. A billion threads of execution. In the meantime, between failures measured on the order of maybe 20 hours, 20 hours is the meantime. Something's going to break in 20 hours, and don't expect to make any run longer than 20 hours on that machine unless you have some mechanism. Yeah. So, what is it going to do to your uh, benchmark, the last line? The benchmark running too complicated? Oh, that's a good question. Yes, that's a good question. <laughs> so the benchmark today, today the benchmark on the machines um, runs at, oh, I think that's light, it runs at uh, about 20, uh, 24 hours. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, so then what happens like that? So the benchmark has to have some fault tolerance built into it. Yeah, so it's going to be critical, it's going to be critical for many applications to deal with faults. Today we don't, right? So MPI does not have a mechanism for fault recovery. We don't have a mechanism. And uh, we need to have some mechanisms in place so that we can recover. You can't do checkpoint restart. You just uh, you've got, you've got this much memory here. I can't do that. It's going to take uh, you know hours to checkpoint. So I can't be doing a checkpoint every few hours. That doesn't make any sense at all. So we have to have mechanisms in the software, in the algorithms, in the applications, which can transition past failure. And um, you know it's a it's a research problem. Today. You know, we don't we don't really know how to do that at scale, running at these things. Uh, for all of our algorithms. And of course we want it to be transparent. You know, we think about uh, memory. Memory is, is, has error correction. That's, that's, a, that's a thing we take for granted today. Errors occur all the time, and they're corrected. They're hidden, hidden under the covers. We'd like to have something like that at the, uh, at the hardware level, uh, but we don't have that. We don't have that at the uh, processor level. We transition past that in a way that's transparent. So we're going to have to build that in. So I think that's a very important <laughs> Uh, issue for uh, XSCO and you know, as we go forward. Okay, so there's a number of things here which become a little bit uh, scary um, uh, or interesting, you know, exciting. Uh, but the you know, memory size is, is not keeping up with the execution rate. So it's just something about weak scalability. We may not have weak scalability. Today we think about 
uh, running applications, uh, and as we run on larger machines, we think about scaling things up, and we get the scalability. Uh, uh, things go from uh, from we can scale our problem as we can scale the application as we scale the size of the problem as we go to bigger machines, and we're going to be capped because we can't uh, quite make the problems as big as we might like to. The node concurrency is going to go up in a way that uh, makes things quite interesting. The total concurrency is going up much greater again than what we see from the uh, performance. And the fault tolerance, as you point out, is uh, you know, going to be an issue. We're going down uh, by an order of magnitude, roughly, over what we just had uh, on our, our fastest machine. So all those things bring about great, uh, great challenges for us. And um, uh, you know, what we're doing uh, in the software we're developing uh, there's a number of what I'll call critical issues. So here's my list of critical issues. You may have a different list of critical issues, but these are the things that uh, keep me uh, interested or excited or awake at night. Um, uh, first thing is we have to do something about uh, the way we do parallel processing. The parallel processing that we do today is mainly through a fork join mechanism, bulk synchronous processing. You can't do that when you have billions of threads of execution. So you have to do something to uh, release that, do something in a more asynchronous uh, fashion, do something which uh, will allow things to go perhaps in an out-of-order execution to allow those uh, a billion threads to keep on going rather than to waiting for everything to synchronize and then splitting things up again. So that's a critical issue. Communication is going to be an important thing. We're going to reduce communication. Develop algorithms which have a minimum communication pattern implement those algorithms. Uh, theoretically, you can show for certain algorithms, this is the minimum communication that this algorithm uh, has given a certain set of conditions, and then implement that implement that to achieve that lower bound, uh, at least to relieve that uh, stress. Use mixed precision wherever possible. So mixed precision uh, gives you a benefit in, in two directions. The first is 64-bit uh, and 32-bit uh, floating point operations run at different rates. 32-bit on conventional machines there's a factor of two. It's twice as fast to do single precision over double precision. On GPUs, the next machine from NVIDIA, there's a factor of three between single and double precision. So Kepler is a factor of three uh, in terms of it. So you're going to gain in performance there. You also have less data to move. You're going to be moving 32-bit operands rather than 64, so you get a benefit in terms of moving data through the system as well. So use mixed precision. The idea might be to start out using uh, short precision, and as the calculation uh, progresses, as you move closer to the solution, uh, switch to a higher precision and then use that to converge. So there's a number of algorithms which you can uh, show that uh, you get a benefit out of this thing, and that's a, that's a way to perhaps help uh, maybe a factor two. Auto tuning is sort of critical. These machines are complicated, and to effectively use them, you got to set the dials right. You got to do the right thing in terms of getting all the switches in the right place to effectively drive it. And you can't let the user do that. So internally, in the software, in the algorithms, you have to be able to uh, have the algorithm or the software direct how the optimization is going. We're going to have a hybrid architecture, and you want to be able to use that in an automated way, letting the software drive where the computations go. And given the differences between those, ar between those hardware components, uh, it could easily be uh, driven in a smart way to get the full benefit out of it. Uh, fault resilience is uh, going to be a critical thing. Build it into the algorithm. Faults are going to be um, a common situation. It's, it's going to be something that happens, and we have to be prepared for it and take advantage of that through the course of our, our, our computations. And uh, perhaps the final thing here is reproducibility. So some people get sort of uh, confused or upset uh, that um, if they run their problem on a machine today and run that same problem on the machine tomorrow, they may get different results. Okay, so I'm making different results because I can't guarantee the order in which things are going to be reduced on a parallel machine. I can't guarantee the way the sum is going to come together on a parallel machine. And because I can't guarantee that, I may have small round off error differences between the results. Those round off errors could be magnified by field conditioning in the problem or in the, in the algorithm, which may produce different results. So I'm not bothered by that. You know, we deal with that in the numerical context by having error bounds for our problems, and I give you error bars under which my solution is good for. And uh, some people, perhaps the guys doing reactor uh, design uh, analysis, they can't have different results on different days. The climate modelers say they have to have the same results for their models on different days. Uh, uh, if I run the same model, they have to guarantee that. 
Um, uh, and you know, if I'm debugging a program, I want to have the same results today and tomorrow on the machine, just so sanity in mind if I try to debug a program. So we may have to develop techniques or, or a mechanism so that we can ensure a certain order in which those operations are going to occur. That order may, in fact, uh, cost in terms of time to solution, but I, I may be able to do that. So that's something that we're, uh, we're working on in terms of the numerical side of things, trying to guarantee that. Okay, so there's a lot of changes taking place at the algorithm and software level. Uh, we have to rethink and redesign our, our methods and approaches. We have many core, we have hybrid architectures, we're still dealing with uh, multi-core commodity parts in our systems, and it really requires us to uh, redesign and rethink uh, what's going on. Data movement's expensive, uh, flops are cheap, Machines have been over-provisioned for floating point operations, and you know, we have to take that uh, into advantage, into consideration. So we're designing software. Uh, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, you know, back in the 70s, we did things for vector machines. Uh, LAPAC was blocked operations. In the 90s, we looked at distributed memory things. Uh, today, we're doing uh, stuff uh, based on a data flow uh, scheduling out of order kind of execution within our uh, the context of our library routines and uh, that's giving us uh, some some benefits so the, the idea at a very high level is to uh, ensure that the matrix is, uh, is is organized correctly and the organization requires us not to lay things out in this uh, uh, global uh, by column or by row fashion but to uh, organize the data in terms of tiles so those tiles are very uh, very tightly uh, held and can easily be accessed. Uh, the layout of the computation to, uh, to be uh, more asynchronous and perhaps even allow for out of order execution, and we do that by expressing the algorithm in terms of the directed acyclic graph. And that may sound confusing or, or uh, complicated in terms of how you do that, but the reality is if you could specify the inputs and outputs to uh, each of the tiled operations, you can quickly form. Uh, the the, uh, the directed acyclic graph of the overall computation, and one way to uh, to think about this is the algorithm, rather than running to completion, runs in terms of generating tasks, and then there's a mechanism, a runtime system, which takes those tasks and executes them in the proper order, respecting the uh, the, uh, the order of, the, of this uh, of this DAG, and executes things uh, uh, in that fashion, and we end up with a much more compacted. Uh, Representation. Uh, you know, the Fort Joy model takes our um, uh, loop level thing, and uh, this is an example for an LU or QR factorization where we break things up into blocks, and those blocks then execute in parallel, perhaps uh, doing this uh, short complement in a parallel fashion. But then we have to join together after that to go on to the next step. And if we take a look at an execution flow in this context here, we're running on 16 cores, looking at time evolving. The colored boxes represent uh, productive work in the computation uh, that are being done by the cores and the blank spaces represent the idle time. We end up with a control, we end up with a, a timing diagram which basically looks uh, something where we're doing intense computations and then we're waiting for this join to occur to do something that sequentializes things and then we, we enter into a parallel regime again. So there's a lot of blank space here, that blank space that's idle time associated with with the computation. The DAG representation allows us to do things more out of order, allows us to uh, basically fill in uh, the spaces while other computations are going on, basically getting ahead of the computation, if you will, doing things in advance and allowing things to uh, execute according to a critical path. The longest path in this graph here is going to be the path that you want to execute the fastest or first because it frees up the most uh, amount of parallelism, and we can end up taking a, uh, a computation which has a, has a, a timing diagram which looks something like this, and uh, compressing it uh, to remove a lot of that uh, idle time, and, and uh, getting something which runs on a much faster uh, time to solution. Can I ask a yes, please. So you propose to do this at runtime? Uh, exactly, yeah. So the, uh, at runtime, the tasks are generated, the runtime system takes those tasks, and then uh, executes them according to that. And you can guarantee that this box on the bottom is optimal? I, I, I can't guarantee optimal. It's an NP hard problem to get an optimal. Uh, so I, I can only, I can heuristically make some decisions which get us better than what we did before. Okay, but is this heuristics randomized or deterministic? I mean, randomized algorithm. 
Right, so I, it, it, it's, uh, it's dynamic, so it's going to have, it may change today and tomorrow. The, the, the actual flow may change today and tomorrow. Okay, so, so that's the, yes. Yeah. Thank you. And how well is it parallelized, the schedule? Does it need to be centralized? Or? Right, so that's, a, that's an important consideration. And let me just say that we have something for shared memory machines, which is a centralized scheduler. We have something that's uh, under development now, which is a distributed scheduler, so that the DAG is not uh, explicit. It's an implicit parameterized. There's a mathematical representation of the DAG. All the nodes have that uh, representation. They know how the data is distributed, and they know where things are relative to that based on the distribution that's there. And then the execution flows on a node. Each node has its own scheduler, but knows at a global context what's going on. That's sort of the nutshell version of that. But yes, that's, that's, you can't have centralized scheduling in a, in a, a billion way parallel. It just doesn't make sense. OK, communication avoiding. Uh, in, uh, so communication is an important thing. Jim Demmel and others have uh, championed this idea of coming up with algorithms which you can say something very conclusively, given a certain set of conditions, uh, that these algorithms minimize the amount of communication that will take place. Period. They have the minimal communication associated with them. And uh, this is an example of that. It's uh, actually an old algorithm. It comes from Alex Hoffman and Pedro Ragavan uh, for looking at a QR, uh, QR factorization, and uh, Jim calls it, Jim Double calls it communication avoiding. It basically goes like this. Uh, we're going to do a QR factorization of this tall, skinny matrix. We're going to divide it up into four regions in this example here. And each of those regions will undergo its own QR factorization. So each, each region here is going to be, be generating its own QR factorization. And uh, when a region finishes, then we have pairs of regions uh, uh, cooperate to reduce their, their, uh, their pair. So these two regions here now uh, have been reduced to a QR factorization of each one. And then these guys cooperate to zero out this one, and this guy is doing this in parallel. And you end up with this, and then you collapse that in, in a tree fashion uh, down to that. And that's the first step of the algorithm. And you can show that that has the minimum communication associated with doing a QR factorization when running at the scale. So that, that's a good algorithm. That's, that's what we've implemented. And it shows very, very attractive features for certain conditions. Long skinny matrices is where it does very, very well. OK, we're, uh, just to give you a, a sense of how well these things work, uh, we have access to a, uh, a hardware platform where it's been instrumented uh, to look at the power uh, being used at various components. So think of power meters being stuck into this machine to look at the CPU, the memory, the motherboard, the fans, and the disks. So we're getting very, very precise information about the characteristics of the hardware. And now we're going to run a program and collect that information while the program is running to see where the power is going. OK, so here's, here's the old uh, LAPAC QR factorization, fork join based kind of uh, factorization. And uh, we're looking at the time to solution. Uh, and this is a, this is a the, the scenario is we've got a quad, uh, dual socket quad core uh, machine. Um, uh, it has this character characteristics, and the matrix I'm dealing with is tall and skinny. One million by 200 is the tall and skinny matrix, so really tall skinny matrix. So that plays into what you're about to see, so keep that in mind as, uh, as I disclose it. So this is a four-join model of the computation. You can see the power being consumed of the CPU, the memory system, the whole system, the memory, and then the disk and so on and so forth. Okay, if, if, the, uh, if, you, if you do an excellent implementation, uh, MKL is the math kernel library from Intel. You know, these guys beat on this thing and they, they just do an excellent job of it. Uh, you know, forget about looking at the code, forget about the source code here. Everything is done at a very detailed level. And they're able to you know, do a much better job, get that time uh, down to uh, something that's uh, you know, close to 60% uh, uh, well, of the original time for the computation, just by optimizing, optimizing the heck out of it. Is, but still four join based. Then we take a look at a DAG based representation. This is a, a expressing the algorithm in terms of a directed acyclic graph, generating uh, the tasks, and then letting the runtime system consume those tasks in that way, compressing out that four join business. So this is what we end up with in terms of the execution uh, for that. So we're down to something on the order of 19, 19 seconds, 100 down to 19 seconds in this case. Big improvement over the four-join parallelism 
Uh, remember that we're dealing with this rather special uh, matrix size too. And then when you go to communication avoiding, we're able to shrink that even further. So the communication avoiding algorithm minimizes that a little bit better, and we end up with a much better um, uh, scenario in terms of that. The uh, energy profile is slightly different, and to be honest, I haven't looked at the, so we need to integrate this, right? Integrate from, uh, to, to get the total energy, we need to integrate from this point to the end to look at the, um, the total amount of uh, uh, energy being used. This is just the, the power, uh, instantaneous power, if you will, uh, for, for that. Um, uh, so again, uh, going from uh, a fork join down to a DAG-based representation, and then taking into account the communication biases, uh, significant uh, amount over what we were used to in the old days. So really a dramatic reduction in terms of time execution. These ideas are being applied to um, all of the dense uh, computations. Uh, so all of the uh, one-sided and two-sided computations, onion plus and QR, uh, as well as the onion value and singular value decompositions are all being framed in this, uh, using this mechanism here in terms of that. And I don't have time to, to show you all the great stuff that we're doing there, uh, but let me just uh, summarize by saying um, a lot of the stuff that we're looking at today on our architectures is really based on old ideas. Um, uh, so, you know, data based data, data flow computations, those are old ideas. Uh, you know, some of the reduced communication stuff, those are old ideas. Hybrid computing, you know, I can remember back when we had the um, FPS 164, the same kind of thing was going on there. We have major challenges, oops, we have major challenges in terms of power, levels of parallelism, communication, hybrid nature, fault tolerance, and it's not a programming, uh, this isn't just a programming assignment. This really requires a deeper understanding and uh, really a great opportunity, I would say, for mathematicians and computer scientists. And uh, let me just end there and uh, probably take too much time. Uh, so there's a bunch of projects here which are putting these things into uh, action. There's a number of uh, groups that have helped uh, fund this. Uh, we have collaborators at um, uh, Berkeley, at, at Colorado, Denver, at INRIA, and uh, at KAUS that are helping to put, these, uh, uh, put this stuff in place. These uh, runtime systems that we have are being used in the context of linear algebra, but they have a much wider, uh, much wider uh, use. They're being used today for, for sparse uh, methods as well as testing. So with that, I'll end. Thank you. Thank you.